Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. I'm Glory St. Germain from Ultimate Music Theory and my very special guest today is Mr. Mark, who's gonna introduce himself. But first I wanna share with you that we are both musicians, we're both educators and the world needs music. So Mark, please introduce yourself. Well, hello, my name is Mark Fonschmidt. I am a violist and a piano accompanist and I also teach violin and viola in Durwood, or no, I'm not, I'm not in Durwood anymore. I'm in Walkersville, Maryland. I just moved about six months ago. So I still have Durwood where I lived for seven yeah. years. Um, but, uh, and I teach music theory as well. And when I was looking for a music theory series for my students to take their RCM exams, that's when I came across Ultimate Music Theory. And I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, we've had so much fun, Mark, and just as I've seen you, and of course, one of the cool things about about all this online thing, when I was a young teacher that was BC before computers, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was a really, a really lonely job because you didn't really have too many people to talk to. Your friends weren't necessarily music educators, and you and I have connected online and through, you know, such as our upcoming event, which is Music Business Mastery where we really connect with fellow educators and we talk about mindset and strategies and tools. And if you're a music educator who would like to learn how you can become successful teaching music theory like Mark, you can dive into our live event. It's three days. I'll pop it up so you can jump in and get registered. It's musicbusinessmastery.live. And we look forward to, to uh, having you join us. So Mark, when you first came into the program, let's talk a little bit about the mindset because it's not just for us as educators, but we also sometimes have to think about our students' mindset. How does that resonate with you? Well, you know, mindset is all about being ready to do your job. Yeah. You know, if, if, you're, if you're not feeling well or you're feeling tired or, um, or it's been a rough day or, you know, you just kick the cat or... You know, your mom just yelled at you because you didn't do your homework again. Um, you're usually not ready to work. Yeah. And uh, and same thing for me, you know, if I didn't sleep well or whatever. But I, I, and I often find myself when I'm playing an orchestra concert and maybe it's, you know, the end of a Mahler symphony and it's been 45 minutes and I'm really tired and my shoulder maybe is feeling a little sore and, um, I often, in those moments, I'm often reminded, you know, this is what I've wanted to do since I was a little boy. Yeah. And it just changes my whole frame of reference. And not all of a sudden that I, I feel, you know, all perky necessarily, but it just it's just a reminder. I get to do this. I've mm -hmm. chosen to do this. And what a blessing. Same thing with teaching. You know, sometimes I'll start a day of teaching and it's already been a long day, but the first student walks in and I love the students that I teach. Um, they're all amazing individuals in their own way, whether they're just starting or they've been playing for years. Um, and it's just really wonderful to be able to see the kids who come in, to mm -hmm. be able to greet them warmly, um, and then to be able to get to work and just to be sure that they're ready to work. Yes. And a lot of times all they need is just a friendly smile and a hi, how you doing? And, <laughs> you know, and then and then we're ready. Yeah. And it can help them with that mindset shift, too. And even as you were talking about your performance and here you are performing in an orchestra and, you know, we've been chatting a little bit about music theory, but certainly you must see the importance of how all musicians, no matter what instrument they're playing, need to be on the same page, as they say, in comprehension of music theory. So what does that look like for you when you're in the orchestra and you're just all given your music? Um, how, do, how do you connect with that? Well, you know, for me, I'm, I'm kind of known amongst my colleagues as the music theory geek. You know, <laughs> So occasionally, as string players, we do have an extended period of rest. Yeah. And so I'm always listening. I'm listening to the harmony around me. I was fortunate to start uh, piano lessons. I didn't start on piano, but I started piano lessons young. And I had a fantastic teacher who taught me um, music theory using good old piston harmony, which was the big thing back in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, but um, I was 
I was really fortunate to be introduced to a lot there. And so if I'm listening and I'm thinking, oh, okay, the measure before I come in, there's a German six chord in the woodwinds, you know? I mean, you know, there were things that I learned that just helped me. Um, and, you know, and then I know, you know, I'm, of course, I'm counting rests too, all 43 of them or whatever. <laughs> but, but I know if I know that measure before, when I get to 43, that I'm hearing a German six chord in the woodwinds, then it's like, yep, that's kind of like that final, you know, right. yeah, I did count correctly. Yeah. That, you know, and phrasing and um, blending, you know, all of those things that we learn as musicians all have theoretical mm -hmm. underpinnings. And if you, you know, if you can see the phrase structure and you see, you know, I we all teach our students to look for repetition and sequence because yes. my goodness, if the phrase just repeated, you don't have to practice it again. You just have to play it, you know? Right, right. So, yeah. So that, I mean, those are the kinds of things that are, that are fun. Yes. And, you know, I remember um, a funny story I heard and, and I'm going to ask you for your funniest story of, as a performer, but I remember hearing a story from one of the, uh, the organists that was performing here for the, the big choir at Christmas and he's in the concert hall and just when you were sharing your story, Mark, and you talked about, you know, you're listening, it's it's your time to rest as the musician, but you still have to know where the heck you are in the music, right? Or you're, you're in trouble. Oh, yeah. So he said he's he's playing this massive organ and the, the choir is singing. And, you know, he's well rehearsed. He knows the music. He's probably got the whole thing memorized, but you still play with your music because just because. Of course. And he said he made one tiny mistake. And the mistake was that he started listening to the choir singing. <laughs> and said that they were so incredible that he just got caught up in the harmony of the of the choir and all of a sudden he realized he didn't know where he was and his hands were almost automatically playing. And he said that moment of sheer panic. Uh -huh. And he said he was reading as fast as he could. He was just reading and reading and just like listening and turning the page and trying to figure out where he was. And he said he finally found where he was in the music. And he said, after that, I never listen to the choir again. I just need to focus. <laughs> but it can cause that, that trauma moment when, you know, because you're performing, you're performing live. So what's maybe one uh, embarrassing Mark story or, or favorite memory that you have uh, performing on stage? Well, I definitely have one embarrassing moment for sure that, that immediately comes out. And we were talking about counting rests, right? Yes. So I was playing a Mahler symphony. I was playing principal viola. I was subbing because our principal was playing a different concert. And uh, I don't remember which Mahler symphony, but I remember there's a viola solo at one point and I'm counting my measures. Uh, I only had eight to count, you know, so two, four measure phrases, pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. And I'm counting one, two, you know, I get to eight, then it's nine, <laughs> 10. And I'm thinking something's missing here. And it's like, Oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be playing. Oh. I had this solo oh, no. and I'm not playing. And so I, you know, I obviously I figured some way to come in. I don't remember exactly what happened. I don't think I had to set out the whole, you know, four measures or eight measures or whatever it was. But yeah. um, it, that certainly was an embarrassing moment. And I remember after the performance going up to, our conductor and saying, you know, Peter, I'm so sorry. And of course he knew exactly what had yeah. happened, but being the professional that he was, he didn't give me a dirty look or anything yeah. like that. And, um, you know, but those things happen. And it Thank was you. interesting. Even a lot of my colleagues didn't, they just thought something was missing, but they weren't sure what, you know, yeah, or who yeah. it's someone who's not playing. Yeah. You know, I remember my husband, uh, he's a professional singer, and he was singing on stage uh, with the symphony, a uh, similar thing. But, you know, you know the rules. You always follow the singer, right? And so he uh, was performing, and, you know, they played the intro, and he came in one measure too soon. And so I'm in the audience, and I know this because I can hear it, and I'm like, uh-oh, you're, 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 you're one measure like into the intro too soon. And just almost by magic, all eyes are on the conductor. And I don't know what the signal is for skip a measure, but he was up there and it was just boom, like clockwork. And the entire symphony went 
just skipped the measure and everyone kept going. And then, you know, Ray was right where he was supposed to be in the music. But same thing, you know, you kind of follow up with the conductor and say, thanks for saving my butt there because <laughs> really wrong in a big way, you know? Well, and, so, and, and that's what happens with live music sometimes. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've been in those situations too. And it's like, Oh, the singer didn't come in right. And often I know from the rehearsal where it's supposed to, or because I, you know, if it's an opera aria, I know yeah. it, maybe I've accompanied it on piano as well. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. And there, and there you have it. I think one of the the things that, of course, you're passionate about it, and so am I. And that's and that's educating our students with music theory. And I think even you know the embarrassing stories that we've shared just now, Mark, is just a testament to how important it is to be a teacher that provides these tools for your students. Because you don't know when you're teaching little Mark, sorry, that they still become educated in your case, a professional performer on, on the big stage with the symphony, like you don't know that you're just teaching this little six-year-old and you know, how passionate are, are you about providing this education for your young students? It, 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 it unlocks doors. Yeah. Um, you know, a big part of education is teaching students to observe what's on the page. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we need to te train the ear as well. Um, <laughs> for me as a string player, um, I've just been teaching some camps, working with students from, you know, middle school all the way up through high school uh, at various levels on different weeks. And um, so we got to music theory class and I said, you know, what do you think of with music theory? Why is it important for string players? And, right. and so I held up my viola and I said, where is C sharp? <laughs> You know, you can't see C sharp on the viola. Right. So if you've got a knowledge of music theory, mm -hmm. it's really helpful. Yeah. It's not exactly essential, but I think it's really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. And it and the biggest thing that it does is it helps students to make quicker connections. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and and my students were working on, you know, learning music theory, which for me is something I've added in a systematic way to my program in the last two years. And right. I've seen, you know, just leaps and bounds. And it's so fun, you know, as educators, we love seeing those light bulb moments, whether it's, you know, finally the, you know, the thumb technique is mastered or whatever we're working on, or finally that pinky is curved. But, yeah. um, but also, you know, gee, oh my goodness, C sharp to D is a half step. That means my fingers are right next to each other, you know, because for string players, it's all tactile. You know, right. it's, it's not like looking at the keyboard where I can see where C sharp, I can see where D is. So yes. you know, those things, Yep, it's just fun. It's a big impact. It really is. Well, I am, I'm so thrilled, Mark, that you are in our um, Ultimate Music Theory program. It's just such a delight to always share ideas with you. And you bring such a great contribution to our community as well. You know, even when we're doing our coaching calls and uh, we really have that camaraderie. And how do you feel coming into those coaching calls? And I know you've even connected with, uh, you know, accountability partners from around the world. I have. Um it's, you know, it's, it's sort of like a, a, a regular shot in the arm, you know, I mean, it's like, um, you know, especially a lot of times as um, music business owners, which is what we are as educators, yep. many of us work for ourselves. Yep. And um, it, it, it can get a little lonely, and you can feel a little stuck. And um, to be able to uh, meet regularly with a group of educators and to hear um, what they're doing and to be able to kind of share war stories, but also, and not just to cry on one another's shoulders necessarily, but to, but to encourage one another and to share, you know, stories of how we've overcome things or how we've, you know, or what we're facing. And then, you know, you're, you're struggling in some area and somebody else says, oh, you know, well, I did this and, you know, try that or, you know, hang in there, you know, and, uh, and a lot of times that's, that's what we need to do. You know, yeah. a lot of my success as a musician is because I just didn't give up. Yeah. I just couldn't stop. And I think you surrounded yourself too with a support system. Right. And, you know, it's one of the things I'm so passionate about um, in, in developing the musical community of like-minded educators that are not about, you know, the woe is me, but as we say, right. hashtag solutions only. How can we help you? 
You know, what can we do? Everybody has a low day, but there's always ways to pick each other up and to encourage each other and, and to move forward with your teaching. And I just want to say thank you so much, Mark. I know you're very well respected and appreciate your humor <laughs> in our in our coaching calls. And um, I, I, I guess I will ask you, what was that, kind of, what's one of the biggest takeaways that you've had since being in the program? Oh, wow. Um... You know, I think the the first really big wow moment was realizing I'm a small business owner. You know, and really having that mindset that I'm a business owner. I was just talking with a, a colleague a couple of days ago about it. And she said, oh, yeah. She said, yes, we are in business for ourselves. And mm -hmm. it, and if you when you think about it that way, for me, it was an aha moment. And all of a sudden, I was, oh, yeah. It just kind of, there was something that flipped in my brain and it's like, okay, I'm a business owner. I have to have plans for what my business is going to do. Yes. Yeah. Um, even at my ripe old age of, <laughs> <laughs> we won't say. <laughs> well, and you know, I, it, it doesn't really matter if we're, right. if we're sweet 16 starting out or, you know, if we've had our aha moments at, you know, the age of 95, it sometimes right. it's just that mindset shift. Right. That helps us to say, okay, and then we kind of play the game a little differently in how we and how we see ourselves and also with what can we charge for our services. We're a professional business owner, we need to be making this. And one of the things that I'm, you know, sharing in music business mastery.live is we're we're gonna talk about mindset and how you can make that mindset shift so that you understand, yes, I am a business owner taking it to the next level. We're gonna talk about strategies so you can really spend more time making money and less time just trying to figure out what you should be doing because that can be a big time waster for us as well. And, and getting the tools that you need so that you can be marketing quickly because we often don't go to marketing school and yet we're supposed to figure that out. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was me for sure. Yeah. Well, it's been such a delight, Mark. I want to say thank you so much. What's coming up next for you? Um, you know, a typical fall for a musician. So my studio is, you know, my new year is beginning in September or actually the last week of August. Yeah. And then um, I'm in, a member of the National Philharmonic and our, our season starts in October. Nice. So, you know, ramping up and, and uh, getting ready for a new year of, uh, of, learning and and fun yeah i love that it is learning and it is fun especially with you mark because you've got a great sense of humor and i know your students are in good hands and they have fun and uh, they're learning from the experts so thank you again mark for joining me today and i'll look forward to seeing you in the coaching calls <laughs> thank you for having me glory it's been a pleasure absolutely be sure to check it out musicbusinessmastery.live and we'll see you there bye now